Come on, technology, don't fail me now. <laughs> there we go. Oh, and it's only me. All right. Well, hi, everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, November 15th, 2013. And it's i got to say, it's a bit of a letdown now to be back in cold, <laughs> rainy Vancouver Island after being... Uh, down in uh, sunny Los Angeles for the most epic weekly space hangout ever, which we did last week. Yeah, so, you've been on uh, the road quite a bit. Yeah, it's been like two straight weeks of travel, so I'm not missing that, i got to say. I'm uh, back home and able to sort of eat normal food and exercise and hang out with my family, so that's all good. So joining me uh, this week, uh, we've got uh, David Dickinson. Hey, here in, in the uncharacteristically cloudy and rainy Florida. Yeah, is it is it cold there? Uh, cold, yeah, cold being, um, and I don't know what it is in Celsius, but about 60 degrees Fahrenheit or so. That's co considered cold here, 60 to 50 or so. So cold. Uh, and Jason Major. Hey, I'm, uh, and I'm joining you here from Warwick, Rhode Island, just south of Providence. And, uh, and it's a very mild day today, but, you know, about in the 50s. <laughs> your, your lower third has gone berserk. What is it doing? Whoa. Oh, you know what's funny? That's the strange thing is, is that's what I see. Uh, that looks like I have a Led Zeppelin with album. My Google fonts or something. Um, so unfortunately, that's what I actually see. So I'm just going to shut it off because of the. That, that looks look. like uh, looks like Alien Roswell higher. Yeah, that I was thinking, is this something that, like that? All right, well, we can, uh, <laughs> there's something that was put onto the gold record and attached to Voyager to help <laughs> guide alien <laughs> civilizations back to Earth. <laughs> well, I mean, apparently that's actually what my Google then uploads to the to the uh, lower third. Even I just assumed it was just my browser being stupid. I'm gonna shut it off because yeah. it's dumb. We don't speak alienese here. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. <laughs> So uh, so let's see. So this week, we've got a bunch of stories, a whole lot of stories. Now, we're going to try a bit of a different format because we've got a bit of a skeleton crew here today. So so there's going to be more stories uh, explained by fewer people, I think. And so maybe in less depth? I'm not sure. Anyway, tell me what you think. Tell me if you like it. Tell me if you hate it. Um, so we're going to talk about the amazing new image from Cassini, which is great. Uh, updates, of course, on Ison, which is now a naked eye object. Uh, and Comet Lovejoy, the Leonid Meteor Shower coming up this week, uh, the Maven launch on Monday. I should put this in front of me here. What else have we got? Uh, we got uh, Mars, Earth-like, millions of years ago. Uh, some amazing aurora photos. Uh, Curiosity's journey up Mount Sharp. Uh, the moon has bigger craters on the near side. Uh, Super Typhoon Haiyan from space. And uh, two workers killed in Russia at a space facility. So, uh, well, let's start with the big, the big story, which is this amazing image of Cassini. And, and I think, was it, uh, was it like a couple of months ago... Did we actually, like, it was like right after the Space Hangout, I think, that we actually mm -hmm. could go and get ourselves into that Cassini Saturn. image, right? Yeah, it was, it was that Friday, uh, July 19th. And um, so, well, the background story is Cassini was going to be in Saturn's shadow. And from that perspective, it was going to take a whole bunch of images with its, uh, uh, you know, both its narrow, narrow angle and wide angle cameras, um, and basically be able to catch, capture Saturn blocking out the light from the sun, which would do all sorts of fantastic optical things with the, you know, the uh, icy particles and the rings and Saturn's atmosphere and the shadow and you know stars and planets beyond. Because um, once you block out that harsh light you can see, well, Cassini can see a lot more um, of the, you know, of, of different things that are around in the Saturnian system. So uh, it, was, it was that day in, in um, July 19th, Carolyn Porco, who's the director of the uh, imaging team in Boulder, Colorado, she, she had a, uh, uh, a website put up called The Day the Earth Smiled, which was telling everybody in advance that this was going to happen. And NASA, uh, JPL, they did the same thing. They had, they had a, uh, a campaign called Wave at Saturn. Um, so it was, it was, you know, just telling people that, that yeah, you're going to have your picture, along with the whole Earth, taken from nearly a billion miles away. And it was the first time in history that, that we were warned, or, or I guess informed beforehand, that uh, our, our planet was going to be captured in an image from somewhere else in the solar system from so far away. 
So I went outside and you know took a picture of of my hand waving uh, waving at Saturn or where Saturn was supposed to be because it was still kind of daylight at that point. Um, but you know I, I sent that into the uh, into the NASA program and they put it into a little mosaic. Some of the initial images from Cassini came back. Um, I think on Sunday night, Sunday or Monday following, um, and they were they were initial images showing you know a little dot of Earth and some of the some of Saturn in, in eclipse and everything, um, and they were really really cool. They were beautiful. They were awesome. But we were told you know wait because the Cassini imaging team is still working on the grand. <laughs> Uh, the grand mosaic, the big image, putting putting all of these image footprints together. Because Cassini took about well, took about 350 different images, and and there were I want to say about 16 different footprints. Um, you know, because Saturn's big, so it can't just you know take a snapshot. It's not like going out with a, uh, a point and shoot camera or your cell phone and going. Chick. So there's a lot of work involved to getting everything all put together into a big mosaic. So they said, wait till the fall. And so we wait, 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 and you know, all a lot of other space stories happened and stuff. And you know, well, it's fall, and the image came out on Tuesday, and I mean, it surpassed all expectations. It's probably one of the most beautiful Saturn images I've ever seen from the Cassini mission, and you know, that's you know, nine years around mm -hmm. Saturn now, so that's saying quite a lot. Anyway, I'm gonna see if I can. Um, let me get, get you, I'm going to get the big share. one here. I've, I've already screen shared one. Oh, okay. Well, I've got the big one. Uh, well, I, I can, I can, you talk. Okay. You, you let us okay. you share. So let me, well, I'll pull up mine. So I know your wisdom here. and then. So. That, that, that original that had come out a few months ago, Jason, we had sat and looked to see what stars uh, it had captured in the background. A bunch of us analyzed that as well to see if there was anything else of interest in there. I, I believe it was uh, looking off toward the constellation Aries where, where the Earth was at that time. Mm -hmm. So because it, it captured a bunch of other background stars as well, but it was kind oh, of sure. interesting to... Yeah. I, I, haven't, I haven't looked at the newer one, but... There was a bunch of stars in there, and uh, I, I'm assuming uh, Fraser has has the image up. Um, yep. There are two images that were put out. One was a kind of a, a regular exposure image, and then they boosted the uh, contrast, so they get kind of a, a super dynamic exposure version. Yeah. But what we're looking at here is obviously Saturn. Um, Cassini is on the night side. The sun is beyond Saturn, so that way all of that harsh light is getting blocked out. Um, the sunlight is shining through Saturn's upper atmosphere, and that's and that's what's creating that really bright ring around the planet itself. Um, and then just in the northern part, you see kind of a kind of a, a black silhouette um, just yeah. outside of Saturn. That's Saturn's shadow, and the rings kind of sneak behind it, and that's the, the, the couple of black bands there that are on the upper half of Saturn. Sunlight is getting reflected off of the icy particles in the rings onto Saturn, so that's why on kind of either side of uh, Saturn's northern hemisphere, there's a little bit of extra light there. And then you have the you know the main ring systems. There's the uh, there's the light band of the E ring just outside. Then there's the uh, the big diffuse. Actually, the E ring is the big diffuse band, and the uh, um, the thinner one is the F ring. Um, so you know this is a perspective that you can only get in eclipse, and and it's just you know. Obviously, you never see from this earthly vantage point. Uh, yeah, it's I mean, cool you, can't, see. you can't get this from here. Only now, a spacecraft when, that's in orbit around Saturn can can achieve. When this Cassini type of shows, when Cassini the shows, <clears throat> when Cassini shows Saturn as a crescent, I always think it's cool too because a lot of people you never see that perspective from Earth. Right so. now, Earth. If you look at Saturn's lower right, there is a particularly bright somewhat bluish little star there, except that's not a star. That's, and, it, and I'm saying it's just uh, basically the brightest star just to Saturn's lower right. That is Earth. That's Earth and Moon. And if uh, there was actually a zoomed in version from, uh, from July, and it, uh, Cassini could resolve the separate dots of the Earth and the Moon, and that was, that was really, really amazing. Um, to Saturn's lower left, there's a particularly bright uh, little spot there. That's Titan. 
and it's kind oh, of very a cool. uh, yeah, yeah it's kind of a it's kind of a, a particularly large you know uh, uh, and you can tell that you can tell it's circular you can tell it's spherical so that's interesting and then directly all the way in the E ring and so that would be the most diffuse band uh, in the E ring um, there is a bright spot and that's Enceladus. And Enceladus is oh, cool. is basically what makes the E ring, and you can see it's a little bit a little bit uh, hazier below that spot. That's because of Enceladus's southern jets that are spewing ice uh, into the E ring, which basically makes up the whole thing. Um, so there's a lot of really fantastic stuff here. Um, yeah, you could just you could stare at this at this picture for you know for an hour and just marvel at it and spot you know different things. One of the things that that was stressed was that. This did have to be assembled. Everything was in motion at the time. Cassini was in motion. Saturn was in motion. Uh, the moons were in motion. Uh, and, and I believe these pictures were taken over the span of a couple of hours. So they, they did have to take some liberties in putting things into their uh, respective locations. It wasn't a snapshot in time, but it was processed as, as it was said in the uh, press release. It was processed for beauty. And I don't think that they, I, I don't have any problems with that because they really did achieve it. This is beautiful. This is, this is what got me into loving astronomy and loving space exploration to begin with. It's gorgeous, and this is in our solar system, and this is real. Uh, fantastic. So let me, let me show you a... Uh, hold on, let me find here. Let me show you something that I've got. Like, have, I, have I shown you, you guys this before? Oh, good. I don't know if you can see this. Oh, oh right. wow, yeah, it made... Oh, did Carolyn cool. sign that? Yeah, so this is signed by Carolyn Porco and... Uh, Phil, <laughs> and this was the old one, right? So yeah, that was, was the old one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was the first version of it. That was from 2007, I think. Uh, 2007 or 2009? I can't. That's remember. been around a few years. Yeah, yeah, so yeah it's, I don't it's remember. Been well. um, so, so it's great. I mean, it's great that they updated it and provided a, a new version of it, and they, you know, they absolutely just did a tremendous job. Uh, what a, I mean both in terms of just communicating with the public and getting everyone aware that this wonderful event was going to happen mm -hmm. and really explaining the significance of, of, of sort of the, the orbital mechanics and how Cassini had to be to get the image of Saturn and, and where it needed to be and then yeah. people to be in this picture and obviously you're not going to see yourself in the picture but, but it meant a lot to people. I mean on the day that they did it everyone was out there with their pictures and they were waving to, to Saturn and and I think it was uh, I think it was great. You know, it's and, and speaking of communication, these images are so important uh, because they do get the public excited and they get the you know they get the 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 people who aren't thinking about space every day like us three. They get them excited <laughs> as well. In fact, um, it was it made the uh, front page above the fold of the at least the New England edition of the New York Times. Um, so I. You know, ran and got a copy of that when I when I saw that. So a reason to I'll buy a newspaper. See that, right? <laughs> there you this go. Is, it, it's made of something. I can't I quite tell those. what it is. It's, yeah. I hear it's not interactive. Keep, I keep clicking and none of the links work. Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> All right. Cassini's well, that's only Cassini's only got a few years left too. I believe it's 2017. It's going to enter into Saturn's atmosphere and burn up too. So let's not if talk. we're lucky. You know, yeah. I mean, there's concerns, there's budgetary concerns, and so yeah. if things go south, it may have to get deorbited even earlier. So oh, I think, uh, yeah, so I think, I keep offering, Canada, we'll pick it up. We will pick up the tab. If you if you guys don't want to yeah, keep any of your spacecraft missions going, I'll have a chat with the Canadian Space Agency. Me and Chris Hadfield will be glad to chip in and keep these missions going. So It's it's the only spacecraft we've put into orbit around Saturn, and, and Voyager 1 and 2 only went by briefly. So, yeah, it'd be a I don't think there's any way that they'll that they'll deorbit these things early. Like, I really think they'll threaten yeah. to do it, I mean, and then people will freak the, out and stop it from happening. The, the RTG is probably good for another decade. So yeah. Uh, Cheshire Tomcat sixty eight says you need that signed Saturn poster in a frame on the Stark Blue Wall. Yes, that's that's why it's right here. It's that's where it's gonna go, right, right there. In the back, yeah. And maybe I'll put it. I'll print off an image of the new one and, and put it above it. So or I'll get I'll get Carolyn to to uh, sign that one too. Um, okay, well let's uh, <laughs> let's move on. So the next big piece of news is that we can see Comet Ison with our own eyeballs. And more comments. Yes, their, their Comet Ison is brightened appreciably this week. Uh, it is knocking right on fifth magnitude right now, 
of magnitude, which is kind of about what was expected. It's starting that long climb uh, as it's passing in uh, beyond the orbit of Venus right now. It's finally starting to feel that heat of the sun. It's starting to act like a comet and, uh, and stream off uh, its uh, material and things. So I got a, a shot at Comet Ison yesterday. It was clear here. I saw it for the first time with binoculars. Very easy object in Virgo right now. It is passing right near this bright star Spica on November 18th, this coming Monday. I bet I'm going to have a feeling that a lot of people are probably going to see it for the first time right around then because you've got that bright star to guide you right to it, uh, low in the east. It's going to be like a third of a degree, like closer than a full moon near Spica. One problem we're having, and it's unfortunate I'm not getting any clear mornings right now, is the moon is going toward full Sunday. So the moon is going to start waxing gibbous after that, and it's going to start interfering with our comet observations in the morning for the next few weeks. So ice needs to really brighten up right now to battle that full moon as it starts moving into the morning sky. I, I've heard scattered reports right now that people have seen it with the naked eye. I don't doubt that's already probably happened in some very dark sites uh, as it's going toward perihelion November 28th. Uh, I think one date that's going to be crucial is right around December 1st. If it survives that perihelion, we're going to have... Ison lined up with Mercury, the Moon, and Saturn all in the morning sky, right in one little cluster of the sky. So it's going to be a very uh, photogenic date right there. Uh, I've heard stories about the comet's tail bifurcating right now, kind of splitting off. There, There's discussion right now that uh, Ison's brightening might be a prelude to it breaking apart, which is one small possibility. Uh, there's there's no uh, evidence that it's actually breaking apart right now. I, I think it's it's following the light curve right now, so... But it's, uh, it's definitely things are going to be exciting in this next week. So look at this picture. I mean, look That's at this awesome. picture of this comet. So this is from Mike Hankey from uh, Moncton, Maryland. Maryland. Um, and he took this one on November 14th. So that's yesterday. It passed very near. I don't see it in that image, but a lot of people got uh, photos of it. It was very near one of the NGC galaxies in Virgo. Uh, and I've seen people, uh, a story we got coming up on the Leonids too, a few people have got images of just surreptitious grabs of Leonids in the same frame as Ison. And I'm seeing some really awesome photos coming out right now too. And you almost, if you think back to Comet Holmes and then you think of uh, the earlier Comet Lovejoy and then Comet Hale-Bopp in the 90s, you see this progression of photographic technology that's come around and just the, the, the skill set that's out there is amazing. I'm totally in awe on what some people do. I see a lot of people using these little Ioptron uh, camera tracking mounts that are able to do, just with the DSLR right on a tripod, do some outstanding images. I'm like, wow. That's I, I posted this image a little earlier. This, was, um, this is from Jerry Lodrigus. Um, yes. I, hope I, I hope I said that right. Jerry Lodrigus of astropix.com. That's astropix, P-I-X. And it show, it's an HDR image, and it shows the, the, uh, the, so the streamers in Ison's tail. I mean, that's, that's fantastic. Incredible. That's one of the most incredible ones I've seen that actually shows a lot of the structure inside you the tail. You won't see that with the naked eye, but you'll, see, you'll definitely see the nucleus in the head. And it, it mm -hmm. does have, uh, even on short exposures, it has that greenish appearance to it right now. So that's, that's kind of cool. So hopefully we have a nice uh, streaming naked eye comet right after Thanksgiving and leading up till Thanksgiving. Uh, there's, there's pretty good chances it's following the light curve. So. Now, and why is it green again, David? Because some people have asked. asked it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the spectrum of the cyanogen gas that's uh, being boiled off. Right the poisonous there. cyanogen gas? Yes. Oh, yeah. We won't pass through it, though. That's the same cat gas that caused the, uh, the, the Halley's Comet panic back in 1910 because uh, wow. we did pass through the, the tail of the comet, and at that time, uh, astronomers had just discovered using the newfangled science of spectroscopy, they had discovered the gas cyanogen, and it, it had been published in New York Times, and they kind of ran away with the story. Yeah, I mean, journalists ran away with stories even then. And people were fearing the idea that there were, the Earth was somehow going to get gas. Now, Comet's tail is actually more tenuous than the best vacuum in the laboratory, so it's not like there's a lot of this stuff streaming around. So take a look at this, guys. Uh, so this is a simulation of Comet Ice, and it was released by the Solar System Scope. That's super um, cool. Have you seen this thing? I, I was just looking at it yesterday. It's really, really cool. It's really I've cool. I've seen so, it briefly, yeah. You know, here we are right, <clears throat> right now, almost. So we're it's at the just... sort of visible to the unaided eye, or maybe even a little, a little early for that. Boom. Yeah, yeah. It, it just passed inside the orbit of Venus a few days ago. So, yeah, yeah. And it's... Uh, it's and you can toward... move that, and you can move that around. Just click and drag on the center screen, and you can get a whole a whole different perspective. 
Yeah. Um, so everyone that says Ison's going to hit the Earth, just send them that simulation so they can. Yeah. Here we go. See. Here's what's going to happen. <laughs> Whoa! Look, it's about to hit. No, it's not yeah. going to hit. <laughs> and this is Ison's first time into the inner solar system too. So it's it's it, this gives us an unprecedented opportunity. Whether it breaks apart or stays together, uh, scientifically, it's an unprecedented opportunity to study these types of sun grazers. We we don't have a lot of uh, studies of these types of sun grazing comets like this. Well, plus what's interesting, too, is it's getting captured, um, it's getting uh, imaged from other planets. Just a yes. couple of days ago, in fact, I think it was uh, uh, just yesterday, um, Messenger released I images that, it, that uh, the spacecraft had captured from Mercury. Uh, it was also uh, Ison and Enki. Enki, were, yes. Yeah, we were um, imaged over the course of three days from Mercury. So that's really interesting, too. Uh, go over to Universe Today. Um, from from our perspective... Uh, from our perspective, Ison is going to be very near Comet Enki later uh, in about a week or so, too. And Enki is one of the shortest period comets, a 3.3-year comet, shortest period known of a, of a comet. So it, it's been very well studied because we've known about Enki for uh, over a century. I believe it was in the 1860s it was discovered. So it's now my duty to remind everyone that Universe Today, spaceweather.com, and uh, OPT telescopes, we're doing a, a Comet Ison photo contest and uh, giving away $10,000 in prizes, telescopes, camera gear, etc. So uh, you, all you need to do is you need to take pictures of Comet Ison and then you need to contribute them. Uh, and the, you do that, there's two ways you can enter. One is through the OPT telescope page on Facebook um, and the other way is that you can uh, send an email to uh, to o to OPT Corp. So if you we'll put a link in the show notes somewhere. But if you come onto University Today and you search for the Ison Contest, or you search for University Today Ison Contest, you'll find our page and gives the and gives the instructions. So uh, and great if, prizes. And, and so if, I mean we've if, been seeing so many great pictures. It's just it's unbelievable. But the best is as, as Ison reaches as I. Ison reaches naked eye and it starts showing a discernible tail. You really don't need more than a DSLR and a tripod. You can start taking untracked shots of like 15 or 20 seconds from a dark sky set. So uh, a lot of people have the gear kicking around to do pretty good photos of Ison with the foreground horizon and things like that. You're talking about this guy. That's that's what I got. I got I got a nice DSLR. That's what I got, I got too. A, I, I got a 14 I, millimeter I, wide I, field of view. I got dark skies. I'm a I'm a normal I am a more a mortal astrophotographer. I'm not one of these people that have these like really ultimate rigs. So. <laughs> yeah. No. I'm 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 totally set to do this. So in the next couple of days, I'm gonna start doing some some morning shots of of ice. And this is gonna be. Here's great. a great shot that just that just rolled in on Twitter um, from Sun Grazer Comets, um, and it shows oh, Ison cool. with. You can some... see the NGCs. With yes. some, yeah, with some background galaxies as well as you know, plenty of plenty of stars. Watch out, those galaxies! Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really cool. it's coming in through the constellation. It's coming in through the constellation Virgo. So there's a lot of good uh, photo ops of it passing near. Uh, there, Virgo is is littered with background galaxies. So, uh, so quick question from YouTube: uh, Will ice ever appear at a time other than 5:30 a.m.? Mm, not really when it's at its brightest right now. Uh, eventually, towards spring, uh, February, March, it's it's going to become uh, circumpolar for higher latitudes. But unfortunately, when it swings around, right now I'm on the schedule pretty much. I wake up 5 o'clock every morning. I look outside and see if it's clear. And if it's clear, I, I get up. And if it's cloudy, I go back to bed for an hour. So that's going to be my schedule for the next few weeks probably. Yeah. So it's just like to really appreciate its greatness, you're going to have to get up in the you morning. you got to get up. Yeah. yeah, astrophotography is commitment. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Uh, but that's not the only comment, right, David? I mean, there's more happening too. I mean, there's a ton. Yeah, there. We we've actually got four comets right now in the morning. They're all in the morning skies that are in binocular range right now. And the brightest comet is actually R1 Lovejoy. Well, probably Ison is probably just passed it in the past 24 hours, but R1 Lovejoy. As of earlier this week, was the brightest comet at, at six magnitude, and it's better placed uh, in the constellation Leo Minor, which sits right between the constellation Leo and Ursa Major. It's one of the minor constellations there, but it's uh, it's it's at six magnitude, and it has a very uh, globular cluster kind of appearance to it. And I've seen some really good uh, photos coming out. A lot of people shot it 
last week when it passed near the Beehive Cluster in Cancer, a lot of people got some really outstanding photos of it near M44 in the constellation Cancer as it passed by. R1 Lovejoy was just discovered a few uh, months ago, and we, we knew it was going to be a bright binocular comet, and it's probably going to hang around for the next few months in that range as it passes up into Ursa Major. It's on a 7,000-year orbit. This one has probably been in the inner solar system before, but it was never discovered. I mean, it always amazes me when you think of comets like that, or Hale-Bopp was on a 4,000-some-odd-year orbit, and you think about what the Earth was like 7,000 years ago. I mean, uh, that was right around the, the beginning of the Copper Age. Uh, and you think about what the Earth might be like 7,000 years from now. Comets always kind of give you the, that perspective on, on uh, what they're going to see and think when they see it come back around again. But yeah. this, one, this one is Terry Lovejoy's fourth comet. The most popular one was the Comet Lovejoy, uh, W3 back in late 2011. That was the one that wowed everybody in the southern hemisphere. Yeah, and it, it passed yeah, really much close. Enjoyed it. It passed much closer to the sun than Ison is going to pass. Ison's passing 1.2 million kilometers from the sun's surface. Uh, Lovejoy was measured in hundreds of thousands of kilometers. I believe it was just over 100,000 kilometers from the surface of the sun, and it survived. So. Yeah, what, was, there, what was interesting about Lovejoy it was that, uh, it actually made a great display from the space station. Um, yes. I remember uh, Commander Ferguson got some got some really great shots. Um, you know, during his final visit to the ISS on uh, STS-135, and he um, he got some really beautiful shots of uh, of uh, Lovejoy. You know, its tail was just coming. You know, it, it almost seemed to be coming right up from Earth's uh, atmosphere. In the next satellites to see um, ISIN, uh, we're going to start seeing all these sun-observing satellites are starting to pass into the field of view, like SOHO and its Lasco C3 and C2 cameras. Uh, probably on perihelion, we'll be like Lovejoy. We'll all be watching the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory for uh, when it gets uh, in the field of view of that. I know uh, one of the stereo spacecraft that observes the sun is already watching several of these comets. So we're gonna. It's it's a cool age where we can just sit online and actually watch and see what's happening. It's a, probably Thanksgiving Day. We're all gonna be watching SDO and seeing what ice and if ice and breaks apart at perihelion or not. So, so let's give people something to do with their evening, which is the uh, Leonid meteor shower this weekend. Well. Unfortunate thing, the no. best time to watch meteors is in the morning too. <laughs> but you, you might can, see a few no, Leonids. You in can the see them if you want to sleep in. You can at least see some meteors, right? Yeah, I, I always use the analogy: is the, the 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 front of the car going down the highway always gets the bugs on the windshield, the, the, and the Earth and the meteors being the bugs. So you're you're kind of plowing forward into that meteor stream. As, as the Earth, past local midnight, you're on that part of the Earth that's rotated forward and facing into the meteor stream, so you're more likely that the meteors you see before midnight have to catch up to the Earth from behind. So uh, the best time to watch a majority of meteor showers is, is in the early morning, and the Leonids are the same. Unfortunately, this is kind of an, an off year. Uh, we're in between uh, Leonid storms. I saw I seen the Leonids back in 1998 from Kuwait, where it was one of the the most amazing not only meteor showers. I think the most amazing thing I saw period ever. Uh, the the zenith velocity rate was getting up toward a thousand per hour there toward early morning, and we're not going to see a storm like that unfortunately until 2031. They'll probably start picking up again. Every 33 years, the shower puts on a good uh, peak. Another thing they have going against them this year is the moon is going to be full uh, right when the projected peak is to come, right about uh, 10 o'clock, November 17th, Sunday at Universal Time. But the good thing is that also favors North America because that's about 5 a.m. Eastern Standard Time is when the first peak, the this shower generally has a, a twin peak. Uh, they're thinking the zenith, the zenith hourly rate, the idealized amount of meteors you would see under a dark sky site is about 20-ish. The showers had enhanced rates still in the past years. People have seen up toward 40 to 60 or so per hour. So it's always worth watching. And this shower kicks out more fireballs than usual. I think, Jason, you said you've already seen one. So saw one last night. Yeah, it was. Uh, I just yeah. I was taking the garbage out, and I just happened to stand and you know get a take a look up at the sky because it was really pretty. And um, you know, within literally within 10 seconds. A bright fireball um, streaked across the sky. It was going north, yeah. uh, northeast to southwest, and it was basically came right out of the radiant. So, um, and 
in meteor shower photography, again, it's like with uh, we were talking about shooting with comets. Is you just need a camera that you can do long time exposures and put and perch on a tripod and just and just aim it at a section of the sky and. Uh, oh yeah, you're not know. gonna you're not gonna catch it, you know, if if by seeing it and, and hitting the and then shooting. So. You know, you know, every meteor I've caught on on uh, with the DSLR, I've always found it after reviewing the film, the uh, well, the film, but reviewing the images afterwards on a bigger screen, going through all the images and looking. That I've never like seen one and had the shutter tripped at the right time, and then like, oh, cool, I caught one. I've never caught one that way. So you just, I'm just, I'm doing three or four minute exposures and just shooting, and then just like just keep it going in a continuous cycle. Yeah, you're drag, always hate, basically drag netting for, for media. Yeah, yeah. What I always hate with the DSLR, I almost need two, because you know how you have that cycle where you shoot for three minutes, then it's got to process, then it's got to shoot for another three minutes? No, I, oh, doesn't. I, it doesn't. That's a mistake. You've got a setting oh, really? wrong. Yeah, there's a setting that will do like a like a dark... I forget. Uh, Corey Schmitz uh, explained this to me. There's like a dark... Oh, really? There's a dark sky, like a cancellation. So it takes like a, it'll take like a shot, and then it'll do like a like a dark shot to try and kind of balance it out. And it's like some setting, and you can turn that really? on, and then it'll shoot continuously. Boom, 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 boom. That, that that might not be available. I've got an older Nikon. It might not be available. I've never that. seen it on my Nikon it's either. A, yeah, mine certainly. Mine's a Canon, but yeah, you can't. Canons, I will say, are a little more astrophotography friendly than not to to yeah. pit. I have a Nikon. So it's like I so, can just say from experience. So what's peak then? What's the time, the, the best time to see the meteor shower? Right around 4 a.m. local on Sunday is when I would be out looking, uh, which uh, the the absolute worldwide peak is going to fall right around 10, 10 o'clock UT, November 17th on Sunday, which uh, places uh, eastern North America at the the best angle. But the peak can arrive a few hours earlier or late. That can happen too. And and with the moon, I would advise, uh, if you can, to get out and look tomorrow morning before the moon gets full. That's another way you If we destroyed the moon, would that help? Um, yeah, but then we wouldn't have eclipses. That wouldn't be any right. fun. Okay. Uh, another thing you can do when you're watching is kind of try to physically block the moon. I've watched I've watched the Leonids during a full moon before and actually been able to see quite a few. I think 2002 we had a full moon during the Leonids. What, what I would do is place myself between a, a hill, or if you're in Florida and there's no hills, like a house or something like that, place the moon behind that and watch from the shadow of the house then and look in the opposite direction, and, and you're at least out of that glare of the moon. So, I mean, the Leonids are the best. They're pretty much the best meteor shower of the year. I mean, yes. especially when you have the storm. I mean, as you said, the 98 one, I saw the one in 2001, and it was like... They no started air. ramping up about... About 96 or 97, they started uh, uh, increasing, and then 98 uh, was uh, a lot of people saw the best uh, shower. 99, I was clouded up for the 99 one, but the 98 one was very impressive. I'd never seen a meteor shower. Uh, you can only imagine what it was like in 1966 or 1833. You hear these reports of, uh, you know, the Star Trek effect of like you're moving through and you see the stars streaming by. People were saying. In the 1966 meteor shower, you actually had the sense of the Earth moving into the meteor stream. You oh, had that Star Trek like it, special effect. Oh, like you I can only imagine. It. I would love to like. see that. That would be unbelievable. Well, 20, 2032 or so, if we're still uh, doing a space hangout, we'll. I mean, <laughs> we'll have another lead. Yeah. It's strange to think we're almost midway between the, the peak of the 1999 and 2032. I was calculating. You know, the the mid the mid range to the next peak is next year so we're we're almost midway there right now I roughly. started universe today in 1999 so and I will be ready to retire in uh, the in the 2030s so this will be perfect it there will be the bookends of my career um uh, okay, so let's move on. Um, so I mentioned Corey Schmitz who was giving me some advice on my camera I just want to show you a picture that Corey did because it's just amazing. So Corey Schmitz is sort of one of the early participants of the Weekly Space Hangout with the, uh, sorry, with the uh, Virtual Star Party, and he just finished up a uh, tour in uh, in Iceland and was oh, wow. getting some images of auroras in Iceland, and <clears throat> sort of this trip that he did perfectly timed the, all of the solar activities going on right now, and so he just got a chance to see some unbelievable Aurora. So wow. this is one. This is one picture. Um, and let me see if I can find this other one. Uh, I see Jupiter in there too. That bright yeah. star. Yeah, it's oh. pretty bright. 
I can tell because I can see I can see Gemini and Orion. I see There's Orion, Orion right, right there on, the, on yeah. the right side. Yep. Yeah, so that's Jupiter right there. Let's see if I can find this other one here. Um, there's another one. Oh, should I queued up? But they're you just. Know you're you know you're an astronomer when you're watching movies like Titanic and you're like, oh, cool, there's the constellation. <laughs> like, uh, okay, here we go. All right, so let me see. I'll turn this one off and turn this one on. Yeah, we're at this Solar Max. We're, we're right on the cusp of Solar Max right now. So, uh, And the sun is actually starting to pick up in activity, so they're seeing more auroral activity right now, too. I mean, look at that. That's incredible. Can you wow. imagine seeing that with your own eyes? I'm even that ice is strange. You know, even that ice is it's almost alien. It feels like you're standing on Europa or something. You know, it doesn't seem like uh, Earth. When, yeah. When I lived in Alaska, you would see stuff like that almost every clear winter night uh, it, because it's dark in the wintertime. Summertime, there's aurora, but you wouldn't see them. So it was it was pretty common to see uh, aurora there. They were, we were talking about in the last virtual star party, aurora were common enough in Alaska to be a nuisance to astrophotography because they would wash out your images when you're trying to do other types of astrophotography. They, yeah, I know. It, it was something that people would talk about a, a, enough that it would actually be a nuisance to taking images of other things other than Aurora. That's pretty funny. All right, so we've talked a whole lot about things to observe in the night sky, so let's get back to the space exploration side of this. Um, well, I guess we started with a space exploration one. Anyway, uh, so the MAVEN mission, the NASA's yes. MAVEN mission, is going to be launching May on. Monday. Maven Maven is the Mars Atmosphere Volatile Evolution Explorer and is launching on Monday, on November 18th, out of Cape Canaveral at 1:28 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's got a two-hour window. Right now, they they just cleared Maven for launch. I saw earlier on Twitter. I was following the account. I'm going to be going over there to watch the launch on Monday, and I'm gonna. I have at least one snow day to stay if I have to. If they delay for anything at T minus so many seconds, I'm gonna. I, I got at least two days blocked off. I can stay over there. Monday, however, looks like the best day weather-wise. They're they're forecasting uh, as per weather about 60% chance for Monday, 40% chance for Tuesday, and 30% chance for Wednesday. So I think they really want to try to get. Maven itself has a 20-day window. And we're in that window right now where spacecraft and the Earth and Mars are lined up where you can launch spacecraft on that minimal energy trajectory to get there. India just launched their Mars orbiter mission uh, last week, and it's uh, making its several burns to head out of, it's still in Earth orbit, I believe, right now, but it's, it's making it several burns it needs to make. Now, MAVEN on the Atlas V, it will be going direct, so it doesn't have to do that multiple burn. Now, Two Jason, years. you've been reporting a bit on, on MAVEN as well. So, I mean, what's the goal of this mission? Well, what MAVEN's going to do, uh, it's, I mean, among all of the instruments that MAVEN has on it, um, what it's really going to do is try to find out what happened to Mars's, um, what happened to Mars's atmosphere. You know, Mars, Mars has 1% of the density of Earth's atmosphere, and that's that's one of the main reasons why it's so dry today. You you can't have liquid water, um, which was thought to exist on Mars's surface, uh, you know, billions of years ago. It, but it can't exist there now. And you know, I mean, there's ice on Mars, and there's ice under the surface, and potentially even you know, uh, uh, pockets of liquid water under the surface. But we can't have the the, the lakes and rivers and seas that may once have been there. And the the thought is is that Mars lost its water because it lost its atmosphere. Now, why did it lose its atmosphere? Well, it may have lost its magnetosphere. So, Maven is going to basically, you know, uh, uh, orbit Mars and try to find out what's going on with Mars's Mars's um, uh, magnetosphere and the remnants of the atmosphere that it has now, and uh, uh, you know, see if see if that's why, because that's basically one of the leading theories. If that's why Mar uh, Mars's atmosphere is gone, the thought is is that the sun's solar wind basically sandblasted it off, you know, yeah. stripped it, uh, uh, stripped Mars clean of its atmosphere. And the important thing is is well, there's two, it's kind of two things. One. Does that mean you know Mars very well could have had the uh, vast amounts of liquid water on its surface in the past four billion years ago, like Earth does now? And two, 
could the same thing happen to our atmosphere? You know, um, now we have, you know, Earth has a, a, a nice strong uh, magnetic field. It prevents the solar wind from stripping the atmosphere away. A lot of gravity. Ion, but, you know, it, planets are planets. And, and could the same thing, if given, if given the same scenario, could it happen to our planet as well? So, you know, by learning mm. about Mars, we learn about Earth and other planets and planets outside of our solar system. So, so that's what MAVEN's goal is going to be. So we have curiosity on the ground digging and zapping with lasers and we're going to have maven up in the uh, up in the sky you know checking out the atmosphere and the ma magnetic field whatever happens to remain of a magnetic field um, so it's kind of like you know a tag team Ma investigation Ma yeah. maven maven will be getting there just in time for the close pass of comet a1 siding springs next year too so that will be uh that that might be a secondary uh, kind of bonus for an observation there. Now, as does well. Maven have the does Maven have even the capabilities of of, of peering outwards and when, spotting a comet like MRO when, does? When I when I when I went to the university out there in Boulder and and went to that conference, I asked that question, and they they seem to think they they could probably get some observations of it. I, I know that it's not primarily designed to do like pretty picture image type mm -hmm. observations, but. But they said that was de a definite secondary mission they were looking at because I believe Mom is going to get there. India's mission is going to get there in time too to to observe comet sighting spring. That'd be so. great. Two more or orbiters going to Mars. Yeah. Um, NASA released a, a sort of a neat video. I thought I would sort of share this right now, which is um, sort of what Mars might have looked like in the past. Let me see if this is going to this going to okay. work. So this is sort of showing that uh, that Mars probably you know used to have water, oceans, lakes, streams, and and then this process, as Jason said, that <clears throat> it's uh, you know at some point its magnetic dynamo shut down. It lost its ability to um, to protect the planet from the solar radiation <laughs> and uh, all of the. You know what that reminds me of? Remember the Wrath of Khan, where they're showing the simulation of the Genesis Project? Khan! <laughs> That's exactly what this yeah. simulation looks Genesis like. Genesis is life. Yeah, you can... So it's coming through a little choppy here, but uh, I, I believe the video, Nancy put the video up on uh, Universe Today. I also yeah. have it up over on lightsinthedark.com, so you can see it in high, high res. It's really pretty. I mean, they did a great job. Yeah. They did a really great job putting this video together. They use, you know, they use supercomputers and all sorts of all sorts of uh, rendering processes to make it look, you know, as nice as it does. This doesn't do it justice, but you get an idea of the of the fly through. Yeah. And then we go up through the dust clouds, and Maven's up there orbiting. Oh. It's really really neat. Yeah, it was a great video. So if you you know if you want to dig it up, uh, like you said, it's on Universe Today, and just do a search for it's called NASA. It's called Mars Evolution, and it really sort of tells the story. And there's some audio that goes along with it as well. So it's it's great. Um, and uh, sort of on that note, uh, there's an update from Curiosity, and so you know NASA's Curiosity rover, you know, has been on the planet now for. Oh, man, almost 18 Over months here. now. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, we celebrated the landing back in uh, back in August. So so of we, 2012. So you know, things we, have come. We kind of have that. We kind of have that 24 month pipeline right now, where there's a launch year, then an arrival year, then a launch year, then an arrival year. So it's like we we launched. MSL in 2011, it arrived in 2012, now we're launching the next window of Mars missions, and then next year they'll land, and then they'll be, yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of, there's something about Mars going on every year now for exploration. And so sort of on that same thing, and I'll sort of share another video, so uh, the Mars team, the Mars gave an update on on what's going on with, with Curiosity, and sort of the next, it's moving to the next big step of, of the mission, and so what it's going to be doing I hope this this works. So it's been it landed, sort of. Let's see if we can sort of show. It kind of landed down on the slopes of Mount Sharp, and this this mountain is like the size of the sort of the whole crater that's landed. Gale Crater is about the size of the Big Island of Hawaii, and and Mount Sharp is like five kilometers high. Now now people keep wondering, like, is it going to climb up to the top of this mountain? And it's it's not, but it currently has landed sort of on the flat area, off the slope of the of the mountain, and sort of the next step that it has to do is it has to get through this 
this darker area here, which is like sand dunes. And so the concern is, is that it's going to get it's going to get snared up as it tries to move through this through this area. But they found what they think is a pass through the through this. Um, through this area, and I'll sort of show you where they're going to do it. And so the plan is to try and get through this pass, and have the have the the rover kind of crawl through this area, and uh, sort of scramble up this this slope. And it's a series um, of like rocky outcropping, so it's going to be a pretty tricky move for them to get up to. But as they do, they're going to be moving up through these geological areas and getting more information about the history of the Martian surface, looking backwards in time, because they've got this great Opportunity that this this crater has dug this this uh, because it's a great big crater it's carved out all of this rock and debris you can get this history lesson this curiosity moves through these layers of geologic formations so uh, this is sort of the area that they're going to try and make their attempt to start to scramble up to the next the next part yeah, yeah. and so they've named this area a uh, Murray Murray how do you say Buttes Buttes um, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah which is uh, Mount, Mount Sharp is uh, Aeolus Mons for all you IAU types out there, so don't send us email. Yeah, <laughs> oh, right, right, right. There's a, there's a big it's not IAU. the official name. No, we, we all recognize that, but it is, uh, it is informally and lovingly named after uh, uh, Robert Sharp, who's the um, founder of, they say, home, that, the founder of modern planetary science. So That stirred up a fair that. amount of controversy when they first released that name. So. I'll yeah. get over it. <laughs> I know. Seriously, you know, I mean, for, some places have more than two names. I mean, we have nobody's... places on Earth that have multiple names. So. All the highways and, and side roads uh, in Rhode Island, they all have three or four names. You tell everyone directions, yeah. you got to give them, you know, they want to know the the route number, and it's like I don't know what that is, but it's <laughs> but this bike or that bike or the fight. <laughs> um, but what's interesting, you know, Mount Sharp is big. I don't think oh. I, I don't think a lot of people realize how how big of a you know it's not it's not just some some hill or a rise even though in some of the wide angle pictures you don't get the you don't get the real sense of it but it's it's eighteen thousand feet tall that's 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 five and a half kilometers that's a big that's that's a good size mountain you know <laughs> it's kind of like Olympus Mons cool. where it's more of a shield volcano where it's mm. it's a like you know like the state of Hawaii or the island of Hawaii rather. Yeah, so I mean, there's no way, there's no way that Curiosity is going to be able to make it up to the top of this mountain. Although, wouldn't it be great? Imagine oh. the view from up there. <laughs> oh, so. nice view. But even as it as it makes more and more altitude, it's going to get a better and better view of the of the surroundings. So, I think this is this is great. It's a you know, I mean, they've already had so much science just getting just getting to this point. I mean, they've made so much conclusive discoveries about evidence of past water on Mars. I mean, they've already fulfilled so many of their science goals, and now it's just they're really just getting started. I mean, this this rover with its uh, with its RTG uh, fuel source is going to be able to go for years and years and years. It's so, going to go for decades. Oh yeah, yeah. 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 So. I mean, we're still getting data back from the Voyager spacecraft, so expect this one to just keep rolling. Um, so uh, one more story. Now, none of us worked on this. Elizabeth Howell worked on this, but I, uh, but I sort of picked it because I thought it was pretty great, um, which is that the moon has bigger craters on the near side. Yeah, it's, it's, we one of the interesting, it's, it's one of the interesting revelations of the space program when the Russians first flew Luna 3 past the moon, looking back at the, the far side of the moon. We always thought the far side of the moon would look pretty much like you would see the, the flat plains and the craters and the mountains, and it wasn't really the case. So it's, it's kind of one of the curious mysteries of the moon, why you have that dichotomy of you have uh, the far, the near side of the moon that's always facing toward the Earth where there's flat plains and there's craters and there's all this varied terrain, whereas the far side just kind of has this, like, cratered mountain terrain and you don't see a lot of these flat areas. But th this uh, discovery from Grail, uh, which crashed in last year, I believe, they they, re they entered Grail into one of the craters around the moon, but uh, it was finding that actually the, the lunar near side, if I remember right, is a bit thicker, and the craters tend to be larger on the near side of the moon than the far side, which is kind of a, a I almost had to kind of reread that at the same time and, and read into the paper a little bit. That's kind of an interesting revelation from Grail. And we have Laddie going up there now, too. That's uh, just starting to return science from the moon as well. So uh, the the moon's still an interesting place for scientific observation. But you get and this idea, right? Like, is the moon protecting us 
Is it? I think it goal. I think it. I think it, it plays goalie to some extent. I mean, we still get hit because the moon is much less massive than the Earth. But I think it, it. It does. I know I've heard that in the rare Earth hypothesis before about ideas that life would have had to ar- arise here. One of the reasons it arose here is because we have a large moon, and it's, there's nothing conclusive about it. But one of the ideas is that it does play goalie to some extent for n- incoming asteroids and comets and things like that at least gravitationally and, and, and things like that. But, you know, it's hard to really tell. We only have a statistic of one uh, Earth here to, to really sample. So, But it is interesting to wonder why the, the moon has that kind of dichotomy as far as the near and, and the far side. I thought it was an interesting study that it's like, hmm, I've never heard that before. Well, then there's also the theory that, um, or at least the hypothesis of the moon's formation itself, that says that yeah. it was, you know, it combined from from two smaller uh, moonlets, or at least at least another, you know, another co-orbiting body, kind of flopped into. Why the moon. we have those near side seas? Yeah, yeah, so the backside's yeah. a little Mar- thicker Mar- and Mar- lumpier because of the original impact. Um, that put two two together to create one moon, and they didn't. You know, it wasn't like a like a full head-on collision, but kind of like a slow motion blop. <laughs> right. I, just, I, th- know, I think it's weird to think. I, I always think, like you were talking about earlier, it's weird to think that just over 50 years ago we had never seen that far side at all. Period. I know. So, it's mind-bending. Uh, we had seen because of lunar libration, the moon rocks back and forth. So we we had seen about 60 percent of the moon. Because you do get a little bit of peer over from from the moon rocking back and forth in its orbit, but we hadn't seen that that far side exactly. I had seen a video of uh, of oh, can't think of the astronomer. They actually did a, a broadcast at the time when Luna three flew by back in the early '60s, like where they were re- releasing the data of of the lunar far side. It was, it was kind of interesting. The photos from the first Russian missions that went by the moon are really blurry. They're pretty terrible by today's yeah. standards, but you could see the actual detail. So I got another video here. So check take a look at this. So this is Super Typhoon Haiyan shredding uh, yeah, that was amazing. Asia. So this is from the uh, this is from the International Space Station. And uh, I mean it's hard to just kind of get a sense of scale of, of this thing, but but you can just imagine. I mean, they were in the space station and just watching it, and it was just filling their field of view from from wow. like horizon to horizon. It's just it's a just a terrifyingly large storm. And as we that know, that was a Cat I mean, Five too, and it went over. So yeah, yeah, and I mean, it it struck the Philippines, and more than ten thousand people were killed, and so it's a it's an awful, awful storm, and uh, wow. but just to see it from space, just of something. What a view! I mean, just to, I always imagine that. I mean, you're completely detached from from this storm. We we were Not getting ISS longer. passes uh, during okay. hurricanes. Hurricane Sandy there earlier, I think it was last year. We were getting ISS passes over that, and we were watching on NASA TV every day. So, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I mean, just another great video from from NASA, from the International Space Station. So, um, and then the last story that I just wanted to bring up because we're kind of running out of time, which was that, uh, and this is just really quick, that two workers were uh, killed at the uh, at a Russian site, Russian launch facility. The and I don't know how to pronounce this, Pliesk. I'm pretty sure it is Pliesk. Yeah. Pliesk. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is this is sort of like we normally when we think of the Russian launch facility we think of the the one in Kazakhstan the Baikonur Cosmodrome which is in which is in Kazakhstan they have another one I guess a little more north and um, uh, and so there were I'm trying to think what, what was it something exploded um, they were doing a, a government it was a military launch so it wasn't yeah. well broadcasted but it was it was prior I don't think it was during the launch though it was during the preparation if I recall I didn't read the article but. Now here's the thing: uh, more than 50 people have been killed at this facility since 1973, including nine people that were killed from a Cosmos uh, 3M rocket back in 1980, and 48 were killed in 2002. And I remember that. So um, yeah. yeah, it's a it's a pretty dangerous dangerous facility, and. You know, we talk about all of the people who have died in space. I mean, there's all the people that died with the space shuttles. There's all the people that have died with the Soviet program. Mm-hmm. But 
you know, the number of ground workers that have been killed dwarfs. Remember the, uh, the launch accident from Proton in Baikonur this past summer that mm-hmm. spiraled off the pad there. They, they don't have the, the capability, like here at the Cape, to detonate, to remote detonate a launch if they have to. Those rockets there, the best they can do if they have any control over them is they can kind of direct it, like they did with the Baikonur one. They just kind of direct it to go off in an uninhabited area and crash. Is how they they do right. their launches. So sorry. So the cause of death um, <clears throat> was uh, poisonous nitrogen vapors were yeah wasn't a lot of yeah they were doing maintenance of the facility and and poison gas killed a bunch of people killed the two people and sent three more to hospitals. So it's uh, awful. I wonder if it was hydrazine. That sounds a lot like uh, when I worked on F-16s, we, we had uh, that hazard to work around. It was, uh, that sounds a lot like hydrazine exposure. I'm not certain if it was. It was a lot. That, I mean, a lot that's of typical the, rockets. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the chemicals that they use with these spacecraft are very dangerous. They, they would tell us with hydrazine that it smells like ammonia, but if you can smell it, it's probably you probably already sustained brain damage from it. So it's it's not it's yeah. very deadly stuff to be around. So wow. Yeah, you've done everything, David. <laughs> You're working on something. You've been, you've been in 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 Kuwait. You've been I, in Alaska. You've I I haven't seen a total solar eclipse that I haven't done. Well, we're only a couple of years away from this. Neither have I. Jason, have you? Yeah. I have not. No. So this yeah. is it. But I we are all going to cross this one off. On Twenty seventeen will be able to. Yeah. We're only what for now four years away from crossing this off our bucket list. So there's only two more total solar eclipses. There's none next year. One in 2015 in the Arctic and one in 2016. So if I don't make any of those, yeah, 2017 will be for me. Let me just see if I have any more questions from anybody. I don't think I do. Um, Hugo Burnham says maybe you have a great mission in for. Curiosity, park it on top of Mount Sharp with its cameras pointing up and over Gale Crater. We get awesome views for years. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah it would be cool, but I don't think they'll they'll make it. Um, cool. Okay, well, great. It was a skeleton crew, but I think we got through a ton of news, and uh, I really appreciate you guys joining me this week. Um, so where do we find out more? David, where do we find out more about you? Uh, this week I was active on Universe Today, Listosaur, Canada.com, and my own site, Astro. Guys with the Z, and I'm guys with the Z on Twitter, and I will be at the Maven launch Monday, uh, tweeting, blogging about it as connections permit. So, I am really jealous. <laughs> uh, Jason, where do we find out more? Because you don't uh, have I a lower third. I, I know I don't. Have, I just have the alien alien language lower third. I'll put it on because it's fun. Um, uh, I'm obviously Jason Major. Uh, I'm at lightsinthedark.com. I also write at Universe Today. You can find me on Facebook at Lights in the Dark, and you can find me on Twitter at JP Major. I also have a um, this thing is goofy, so I don't even want it on here. Um, I also have a, a, a little uh, additional pitch. The Year in Space 2004 calendars are in. These things are super cool. Um, they're published by I want to remember the name of it. It is Starry Messenger Press. And um, they're you know big glossy calendars. There, I've got one from 2013 just sitting on my wall all year. Um, and there's a, they're running a special on them. So if you go to lightsinthedark.com, you can find out where to order them. But they're just chock full of awesome space news every day. Is uh, you know I I get space history. We're going to be here, doing so. a bunch of giveaways for that yeah. for that calendar. We've got three giveaways planned. I think coming up in the next month. So it's a, I, I agree, it's an absolutely fantastic calendar. Yeah. So 2000, I mean, 2004, isn't that a bit late? Did I say 2004? 2014. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. So, <laughs> I just um, to... so yeah, I mean, no, I'm literally, I love this calendar. Um, I love the, the 2013 one, uh, mostly because, I mean, you can find calendars with, with all sorts of images on them. I love the fact that every day uh, has space history. So it tells you today... In 1968, this happened, or today in 1997, this launched, and um, and that's really neat because when you're when you're you know a fan of space news and like to talk about things like I do, it gives you a lot of just kind of like hey everybody you know look what happened 37 years ago, look what happened 50 years ago today. So you know it gives me some leads for space news and it's also really super interesting. Anyway, uh, the tw- uh, the 2014 calendars are available so. Find out how to order them on lightsinthedark.com. And like Fraser said, there's going to be some giveaways on Universe today, so keep an eye out. Sweet. 
Cool, okay, and you can always find me at universityday.com, and we're still releasing tons of explainer videos on YouTube, so if you haven't already, subscribe to YouTube, and uh, you'll get notifications when we release new videos. No, you won't. You will, you'll, <laughs> <laughs> that, that is all broken. Um, but, uh, but hopefully you can sort of keep track of what we're doing. So, um, yeah, so if you haven't already, subscribe on YouTube. Check out universityday.com. Uh, I'm F. Kane at Twitter, although I don't really use it much. You need to tweet more, Fraser. I know, I know. I'm busy. I'm busy. <laughs> it's, either, it's either produce content or tweet. And I, I've chosen produce content. So uh, what have you chosen? Um, no. I tweet content. Wow. Yeah, he tweets content. Oh, hack <laughs> the system. All right, well, thanks, guys. It was fantastic to talk to you. Thanks to everyone who watched. And uh, the next thing, I guess, is going to be the virtual star party on Sunday night. And Scott has been cool. running the show for the last couple of weeks, but hopefully I'll be able to show up this week. So. And look for Leonid. They're going to be up yeah. there this weekend. I will try, but it's going to be very cold. So I probably won't stick up for very long. You're Canadian. I know, I know. Cool and that. I'm going to, like, really dark <laughs> skies, but that moon, I'm not really crazy about it, so. Um, cool. Great. Right. We'll see you guys later. Thanks a lot. See you, everyone. Have a great weekend. All right. Take it easy.